Uh, the whole thing is a picture must have impact. Free pictures played, well, free pictures played tremendous importance in this world. One was that little baby crying in a railroad station in Shanghai, and that really got people. The other one is Bob Kappa's Spanish partisan shot and falling. And the third one is this Frenchman crying. Do you remember that picture of a crying Frenchman? You suddenly had a sense of defeat, you know, the horror, the grief, this little baby obviously sitting in the middle of his whole station blown up crying. You figured, my God, what's happened to Papa? What's happened to Mama? What's happened to him? This is something life did better than anybody in the world. Uh, it's highly serious. That's serious war. And the photographer is probably being shot at. And he had to get ahead of the other head of this, probably the lead man. He had to be ahead of him. Then he got to get composition, all the technical things. When you're scared to death and the bullets are flying all over the place. There, of course, is always the question about what motivates a, a photographer or a reporter uh, who goes into places where, that are threatening, whether it's a revolution or whether it's regular combat or, or uh, whatever area it is. Uh, how does he do it? And the answer is simple. Uh, it's simply that one feels that he has a responsibility to cover the events of his time, that he has a strong feeling about this is a moment of history that should be recorded, and that's what keeps me in here. I know that when I was in combat a number of times, I have said to myself quietly, what am I doing here? And I've always been able to, to argue myself into continuing with the thought that this is my place and time. What is a common denominator is when it's tough is fear. And I think I may have met only one man who suffers no fear. He's probably crazy. Everybody has fear. And a question of fear is sort of surviving and doing something even when you're scared. But you know, courage takes a toll. I mean, you know, after a battle, you can be in an awful mess. I had nightmares for years. I mean, I would wake up and for years, and if I talk about it, I'll probably have them tonight. There are deep moments when one takes pictures and one, when one finds it difficult uh, to stand away from it. One of the series of stories that I've made over and over for years has been refugees. The fleeing uh, Korean refugees, uh, the Chinese fleeing the communist forces, I don't see how anybody can operate a camera, can watch this and take pictures of it and not feel deeply the sufferings of these people. It's a tearing circumstance, a very deep, agonizing circumstance. Nobody gets blasé. You know, men uh, who've been in war can be wounded without having suffered a wound. I think a lot of our veterans, this has been problems. You see so much. You can see too much in life. At the moment of a signing of a truce in the old city, they actually needed my fountain pen. They didn't have a fountain pen. I gave a lint of my fountain pen. And I nipped in and did this neighborhood which looked exactly like Fiddler on the Roof. It was these old little houses. They were there, they were packing, had no destruction. And then I returned there 24 hours later, and this had been looted and burned. So pictures taken from roughly the same place. 24 hours later, it shows you what destruction was. The Arab rushed in thinking they've got gold in the carpets. They were just poor people, but you know, the Jews, a lot of gold. Ripped everything, burnt everything. And looting is insane. I mean, I saw them break doorknobs off. They would loot in a way that you destroyed. You had no value left. We had extreme excitement. You know, you knew when all, all was going well because the story was exciting. You knew the pictures were exciting. And, you know, you lived in this sort of set, and you knew you had it. And by the time, you didn't even have to look at them. You knew you had the pictures. But it's still a terrible thing to see, like, a little girl running down a main street, you know, the whole town in flames, running around looking like a, looking like a little animal, you know, a thief out. She's so scared. And you know what really scared this little girl most? She had lived in the ground floor of a little house in the old city. They move her to the new city, they put her on the third floor of a building, and she's scared. She's never seen stairs before. She doesn't know what to do with stairs. 
Okay. She's been through all of this, but what really scares her are the stairs. The most exciting story I've ever been on is, is probably unique in the field of coverage. It was the day that I covered the liberation of my own prison camp in the Philippines. Uh, after uh, more than two years as a prisoner of the Japanese, I, I, was, I got out, was repatriated, rejoined the American Armed Forces in the Philippines, and that day was with the flying squadron that uh, broke through the Japanese lines into Manila, and I followed in through the lead tank. It was named um, Battling Basic and pushed down the gate, the fence of my prison camp, and went in and liberated the camp. There were between four and a half thousand to five thousand people in that camp. Many of them uh, uh, were very close to starving to death. Many had starved to death. And when we broke into the big house, and first the, the uh, prisoners didn't know who we were. They thought we were Japanese who were breaking in there. Finally, someone, it was dark, someone said, uh, if you, you say you're an American, if you are an American, put that, that flashlight on yourself. And I put the flashlight on myself and said, I'm Carl Mydans. And a roommate of Shelley screamed and said, my God, it, it is Carl Mydans. And Life magazine that week used a, a headline across two pages with my pictures. The headline read, my God, it's Carl Mydans.